I... Because card games are still game design, right? And they had the really cool Game Boy Color game, and a cooler Japan-only sequel, and... Ugh, screw it, I just want to talk about cards. The Pokemon trading card game was my very first introduction to the concept of a metagame. Few things are more nostalgic for me than browsing through the old Pojo guides put out in the late 90s and early 2000s. Things I've read dozens of times, dedicating every bit to memory. Who could forget such classic zingers as Magikarp with looks? And in the great Magneton tradition, this guy sucks. Classics. And while the game certainly has its issues, it was overall fun, simple to understand, and offered a decent amount of experimentation without being too overwhelming to newcomers. Sure, the game was probably better balanced in Neo Genesis, or some newer set that I lost interest in thanks to Power Creep, and it was obviously simpler to understand in the earlier two sets, but I'm going to discuss the state of the game after the release of my personal favorite set, and the one I know best, the Fossil Expansion. In the beginning, Haymaker created the Hitmon and the Buzz. And Haymaker said, let there be jab. And there was jab. A cool 20 damage for a mere single energy. Most competitive games have a simple effective strategy based around speed, in which other strategies evolve around and grow from. The Zerg Rush, the Yada Lock, picking Toad in Mario Kart, you know what I'm talking about. Pokemon was no exception, and in fact, few games before or since could match its unprecedented level of speed. Thanks to cards like Professor Oak, Computer Search, and bam, 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 bam. Burning through half your deck in the first few turns is not only possible, but likely. None of the Pokemon in Haymaker need to evolve. Just lay them on the field and they can attack in that turn or the turn immediately after. It's not that Haymaker didn't take skill, you needed to make good use of your disruption cards while also not growing overly attached to them, but fundamentally, they were simple to understand and powerful. Hitmonchan, Electabuzz, and Scyther were the standards by which all other cards were judged. But Haymaker was not the only archetype, and there was one that I would argue had a small advantage over it. Rain Dance. Unlike Haymaker, Rain Dance played the longer game. You had to do a bit of setup here. First, you needed to get a Squirtle on the field. Then, you needed to evolve it into a Blastoise. You also needed to get a powerful Water-type Pokémon on the field other than Blastoise, usually Articuno, Gyarados, or Dugong. And finally, you had to fill your hand with Water Energy. If you got to this point, the deck was nearly unbeatable because of Blastoise's Pokémon power, Rain Dance. This let you circumvent the usual single energy card per turn limit, instantly powering up your devastating 50 damage attacks while your opponent is helpless to build up anything. Articuno and Gyarados both had a resistance to Hitmonchan's attacks, and all of the Gera Arti Gong core had the ability to paralyze a particularly troublesome foe. While the Haymaker player could turn the tide with a well-timed slash or thunder punch, the vast HP pools of the Rain Dancers, combined with the liberal usage of Pokémon Trader, Energy Retrieval, and yes, Professor Oak, was usually enough to see them through. If Haymaker did not win the initial sprint, Rain Dance would assuredly dominate the rest of the race. What hope did the rest of the meta have? Enter Mr. Mime. This creepy weirdo is an absolutely fascinating card, undeniably tailor-made to address the growing concern of Rain Dance. Essentially, Mr. Mime just flat out cannot be hit by attacks that deal more than 20 damage. With Mr. Mime's low 40 HP, this doesn't seem like much of a problem until you realize that none of those big Rain Dance nukes have a single attack that deals less than 30. Mr. Mime's Meditate attack steadily grows in power against Rain Dance's big HP Pokémon that were liable to take a lot of hits, so it's only a matter of time until he whittles them down. 
and Mr. Mime putting up a wall made him a good combo for slower Pokémon like Alakazam and Gengar that let you do all sorts of nasty things to control the field. And if the opponent somehow has little hits to chip him away, Chansey was a great option to absorb the small hits that Mr. Mime couldn't handle. The trouble was... This deck was slow, and didn't match up well against a good Haymaker deck. Gust of Winds could potentially bring forth the pieces before they grow into anything meaningful. Hitmonchan could realistically beat Mr. Mime or Chansey in just two turns. Magmar stops everything from working. And Scoop Up heals your Pokémon before Gengar is ever even an issue. Sometimes, simple brawn can beat over complicated brains. This triangular relationship of Raindance beats Haymaker, Haymaker beats Mr. Mime, Mr. Mime beats Raindance, formed the fundamentals of the metagame. But note that this was only ever really a guideline rather than a hard rule. While Hitmonchan and Magmar held disadvantages against Raindance, Haymakers usually ran Electabuzz and Scyther as well, who could strike a Water-type weakness. Raindance started including Lapras in the Fossil Set, a fast, high HP, low damage alternative that could take out Mimey in a pinch. And Hitmonchan is one-shotted by a powered-up Kadabra, and can barely even touch the Ghastly line, especially when they released fossil versions of Ghastly and Haunter that were, you know, actually playable. But the triangle was a good guideline, and gave the player base an idea of what to expect. While the jungle set introduced this interplay, Fossil is really what perfected it, offering counter-triangle options so the entire game wasn't just rock, paper, scissors. Additionally, it offered anti-meta options to experiment with so that this could be viable. Raindance too slow, but Haymaker too fast? Try a Wiggly deck, or The Sponge, starring the new promo Mewtwo. Both incredibly strong choices for those who want to do just a little bit of setup. Want to turn their rampant card drawing against them? Try Moltres' Wildfire deck, and burn away all their cards, stalling your way to victory. Just watch out for Gambler and Lass. Mix up your Haymaker deck with a Hitmon Lee, or go for an Energy Trans plus Pokemon Center deck if you really want to do something different. Try throwing a Ditto in, since it can work with any deck and save you some energy. Or an Aerodactyl, which can remove the core game mechanic of evolution. And while it may be difficult to find room for him, the sheer stopping power of Muck against Raindance and Mr. Mime is undeniable. The meta at this time was small enough, yet expansive enough to allow for all sorts of mind games, counterplay, and alternatives to well-known strategies that a best deck or best variant wasn't a guaranteed card set. It was based on how well you read your opponent's strategy while executing your own. If you're interested in any of these in particular, leave a comment saying as much, and I'll give you a quick rundown on how they might have been used. But for the rest of ya, hopefully you can see how mastering that delicate balancing act, where everything affects everything else, that's how you design for interplay.